Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of Experimental Cataclysm, the show where we talk about recent changes to the experimental version of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. So first up today, let's talk about appliances. As you probably know, we've been getting a slow trickle of new appliances for the power grid system. I spotted this PR from Sun Fan Trung uh, that added several vehicle parts as appliances. This includes the welding rig, the chem lab, the forge buddy, and a handful of the kitchen parts that you can put in your vehicle. There's not actually much to talk about this this is more just me pointing out that they exist we previously had stoves but we did not have the proper food co kitchen buddy and and things like that i also saw here that there is some ammonia related stuff that is in the appliance menu now as well this is from a separate pr and it's apparently part of a chemistry rework the prs that i did see were all related to ammonia though i didn't see any other chemistry stuff the generator here i guess is part of a process to make ammonia in the game i've never really wanted for ammonia <laughs> In this game, people on Discord did say that it's used to make mutagen and a few other things, but I don't really do those things, so I'm not very familiar with this. There is probably more stuff coming in the future for that chemistry rework though, so you know, just we'll keep an eye on that as it develops. Next up today from Lovum, we've got a rework of construction sites in the game. You've probably seen these around, various construction sites and partially built houses have existed in the game for a while now. Unfortunately, they all looked basically the same and they were pretty lacking when it came to any Thing useful. Previously you might find like a cordless drill or a random tool or two but they were devoid of construction materials and they pretty much didn't have any real value. Well now there are multiple possible layouts for these sites and they actually contain some items that have value to the player. The different layouts will be in different levels of having been constructed although while I was testing all the ones I found had these half built brick walls. Now instead of being empty you'll find some tables with assorted tools and the two that I saw over and over were the jackhammers and concrete mixers. I saw both electric and gas jackhammers and although the gas one is much more valuable they both are nice to find early in the game. So in addition to the tools you can also find some basic building materials. The locations that I checked had two things that were noteworthy which was sand and cement. The sand appears as these mounds of sands and at first I couldn't figure out how to take them apart for just regular sand that we can actually use but it turns out that you can just smash them with the S key. I'm not sure if there are other ways to do this but that you know that worked for me. It also does provide quite a lot of sand so this is a reliable source of sand in addition to the bags that you might find at like the hardware store or uh, landscape locations. Now the other material here is cement which comes in the form of these cement pallets. You can deconstruct these using the deconstruct simple furniture option in the construction menu which will then give you bags of cement. Unfortunately both sand and cement are relatively low value. You can go through an entire playthrough without ever really requiring either one but regardless, this is a pretty massive improvement to the construction sites in the game. They make more sense realistically, they're more varied now, and potentially they can actually provide you with some valuable tools. So this takes them from being a location that you would roll past and ignore, to being something that actually might be worth checking out. Next up today from Night, we've got a change that makes it so that elevators actually move items that are in the elevator. Now there aren't really many elevators in the game and it really isn't a huge change that's going to drastically affect your game or anything like that. However, I do have some vivid memories of playing through one of the old style labs that had that elevator at the entrance. Basically, I went down a floor on the elevator and I killed a whole mess of zombies in the elevator that I wanted to dissect for CBMs. However, there were probably a couple hundred enemies in that lab and I was wasn't able to dissect them without being interrupted. I remember when I would go up in the elevator, I discovered that only the player character would move up a floor. All the corpses were left on the floor below. However, now with this change, the elevator would have brought those bodies up with me so I could easily dissect them on the ground floor that I had already cleared out. Now, like I said, it's not going to change the way you play or anything like that, but it is a nice change that makes sense and I'm pretty happy to see it. There probably aren't very many circumstances where this is super relevant, but the one I mentioned previously is like a good example that I actually personally experienced. So yeah, I really like this change uh, because I have personal memories attached to this being an issue. So yeah. Next up today from Will and Brink, we've got changes to the interaction between albinism and sun exposure. So if you didn't know, albino is a trait that you can take at character generation, which, you know, it makes your character albino. Is albino a bad term, by the way, or is that like the acceptable term? So sorry if that's offensive or something. I don't know. Anyway. Anyway, previously, if you had this trait, you would get negative effects from being in the sun that could only be countered if you had a certain amount of coverage. There were no tears to it. You either were protected or you were exposed to 
to the sun. Now, and man, I'm hoping I'm reading this right, if you have 95 to 100% coverage on each body part, you will be protected from the sun. If you have 85 to 95% coverage, you will then suffer focus loss. And anything below 85% will also cause pain, and the likelihood of having that pain increases the lower the coverage is. These effects are also calculated for each body part, so being naked in the sun with albinism is going to ruin your day pretty quickly. And when you suffer from these effects, there will be a message printed in the log saying that you're sunburned or that you're exposed to the sun. Your eyes, your hands, and your head are handled slightly differently from these standards that I just mentioned. Hands work the same way as they do with cold weather in the game. If you've got pockets and the thing that you're wielding is small enough, you're treated as keeping your hands in your pockets to be protected. Your eyes are all or nothing. You either are wearing certain protective gear or they're 100% exposed, so keep your sunglasses handy. And then your head, again, is something that works similarly to how we handle cold weather in the game. If your head encumbrance permits, you will use the hood of a jacket or whatever you're wearing in order to protect you from the sun. Now, as I said, I don't really use this trait, so I'm definitely no expert. It's been years since I used this trait, but it does seem to me that mostly your gear will protect you from most of this exposure. Other than having sunglasses as a priority, I usually have most of my body covered anyway. I think most players do, so I don't think this will be a huge issue. And I do think that this is an improvement over the old system because it's no longer binary. There are actually tiers to the effects on your character. Next up today from Net Sis Fire, we've got several additions to wild plants as well as adding them to recipes where they're valid. So there were quite a few plants added in this PR. I'm not going to go over all of them individually. In addition to finding the plants themselves, which then you, you know, you obviously you can harvest them for materials, many of these items do appear in the foraging tables. So as you forage through the underbrush or whatever that stuff is called, I forget, uh, they will show up in those drop tables. Now there weren't many unique recipes added for use with these plants. I only saw sarsaparilla tea and wintergreen oil. And on the note of wintergreen, this is actually a plant where you can eat the leaves to get a painkiller effect. You can also refine it into oil for a much stronger painkiller. And frankly, I'm a little sus of this. I find that oftentimes when people add natural remedies, they overestimate their effectiveness. So eating this raw plant actually has roughly the same painkiller strength and magnitude of eating an aspirin, but it only triggers about 50% of the time that aspirin normally would. Now aspirin in in reality is kind of a miracle drug and for the implication to be that just eating this random plant is the same as taking a modern medication I do find that a bit questionable I understand that the effect only triggers like 50% of the time which is you know I suppose is one way of making it less effective and although a quick Google search does reveal that it contains an aspirin like chemical I am still very skeptical of all herbal remedies when compared to modern medications also if it's an aspirin like chemical why does the refined oil have the painkiller 2 effect. This is basically the same effect as codeine, which is an opiate and obviously much stronger than aspirin. But anyway, that's more of my opinion and less of an actual criticism because let's be real, I don't know that much about wild plants. On a more game related note, I did see that some of the items listed in the changed files here were marked as having a positive effect on your health. And this is a problem because we did recently talk about the rework to the health system. Foods are now supposed to be capped at zero health and drop to negative one if they're unhealthy. So for instance, the sarsaparilla tea here gives a plus one to health when it should probably actually be zero. Now this PR was likely started before those changes to the health system appeared in the game, but it's like the only note I have here that's actually, you know, valid and not just my opinion. Right, but other than that, I have no real opinions on expanding wild forageables. I very rarely forage in this game. Now I know a lot of people do the in the woods playthroughs and stuff like that, and that definitely will help them out to have more plants and more calories available to them. However, as I I said I'm very just naturally suspicious of herbal remedies and such especially implications that chewing a leaf gives you the same potency of painkiller as a modern manufactured medication uh, but yeah like I said I'm not going to cover every single plant there were at least six of them and there were associated items for harvesting from those plants and a handful of recipes using those items in addition to adding some of the vegetables to existing recipes such as vegetable salads uh, but let's move along though I feel like I rambled a little bit about that one next up today we've got some reworks to solar panels from actually a cat. So we previously had two basic forms of solar panels. There were the regular panels, there were the upgraded panels, and then those two panels could also be used to make reinforced versions of themselves. And apparently there's a collapsible solar array, which I've never heard of or seen before, but I did see it listed in this PR. If they were added in this PR, then I completely missed that, but uh, I've never bumped into them in the game previously. So the first thing that this PR did was rename the upgraded panels to advanced 
next panels. Now, I know everybody hates when names of things change, but this does actually make sense. Upgraded panels implies that it's just a standard solar panel that has been upgraded when that's no longer the case. In reality, these are advanced panels that use advanced solar cells. These advanced panels produce more electricity, which wouldn't make sense if they use the same solar cells as the standard panel, which I'm sure is very confusing, and there are still some issues with this renaming as well. So for instance, the items themselves were renamed to advanced, but the appliance version was not. It's still listed as upgraded panels. So if you take your advanced reinforced solar panel and install it in your vehicle, it will be listed as upgraded reinforced solar panel, which will inevitably lead to some confusion. In fact, me saying that out loud was probably confusing. But anyway, let's get past all of that. The general purpose of this PR was to address the upgraded versions of the panels. The issue was that despite having the exact same surface area, the upgraded panels provided more power than the lower tier panels, but they were made of the same solar cells. This does not make sense. If these cells are the same and the surface area is the same, they would produce the same amount of power. To remedy this, they've added advanced solar cells, which are used in these advanced panels. Since they are better cells, they will provide more power compared to a regular solar panel of the same size and shape. However, this also means that you can no longer take apart regular solar panels and build the higher tier panel. I think at the baseline, this is totally fine, and all of this stuff does make sense. It's a legitimate thing to change. My issue, however, is the rarity of these advanced cells. Currently, they can only be obtained from advanced panels. They don't spawn anywhere in the game, and these advanced panels themselves are quite rare. These only appear on, I think, four vehicles in the entire game. So you can only get them if you luck into finding one of those rare higher tier cells solar vehicles. Also, solar vehicles are pretty questionable, to be honest, in the first place. It makes more sense for these to appear at locations rather than on a car. And I feel like these advanced panels should be added to buildings in the game. Maybe they're high tier and maybe they wouldn't appear on your average home's roof or whatever, but they would 100% exist on certain commercial or industrial buildings. It's becoming increasingly common for solar panels to appear on roofs, and it makes sense that some people would splurge for top-of-the-line panels. However, currently, since they only exist on vehicles, I don't really think you're going to be able to find any of these. Also, if you do find them, odds are good that they'll be badly damaged because of the nature of how vehicles spawn in this game. And you can't craft them unless you find and harvest existing advanced panels. This is not something you can make yourself. So yeah, this is a pretty notable nerf. I don't really expect you'll be using these panels very much unless you get some pretty good RNG. It's definitely possible to go through several playthroughs without ever seeing one of these advanced solar vehicles with these panels. I think they should be added to a few random locations. Even a quick Google search shows that New England, it's, it's not a great place for solar farms, but there are a few of them there. And we don't necessarily need solar farms in the game, but even putting them on a few factory rubes or something like that would be a real boon to players and would probably be more realistic. Moving along now, next up today, we've got a pair of videos posted by Bombastic Slacks. I really like when the devs interface with the community, and I'm obviously biased towards video content, so I wanted to mention it. They do cover a recent change that they had been working on, which allows for players to more easily shuffle things between their pockets. Previously, the only control that really existed for pockets was the blacklist and whitelist systems, which were totally fine, but ultimately a little confusing, and they didn't offer you very much direct control. This new system will allow you to address items individually, moving them between each pocket. But really, I'm not going to cover this change in this video. It feels sort of crappy for a dev to make a video and then for me to just take everything that they said and rework it into my own video. So instead, there will be a link to the video in the description down below. There are actually two of them. One of them has commentary and the other does not. I'll be linking to the one with commentary since it explains how things work. And then the second video is more recent, so it shows more up-to-date information but it doesn't have any commentary. You can check his channel if you want to find that other video. Moving on though, next up today we've got a pretty massive improvement to cars from Kevin. Actually, when this was talked about on Discord, it was pointed out that this is actually like a big collaborative effort with multiple people, but I'm not really sure how to see everyone who had worked on this. So sorry about that. Kevin's name is at the top. That's usually, you know, who I shout out in my videos. I try to, you know, I'm not trying to slight anyone. I usually like to call people out, but I don't know who all worked on this. 
Anyway, this change, I don't fully understand everything that is happening behind the scenes, but I do understand what it means for you as the player. Previously, if you drove your car on a diagonal, it would leave gaps in your vehicle. You could see this in the sprites. You could move diagonally through these gaps to enter a vehicle, even if it was a fully enclosed car. And that's just how the game was. It wasn't intended to work that way, and obviously it would give zombies access to your vehicle even when it was fully enclosed. Well now, hopefully this problem has been fixed. When you turn your vehicle and you're in a situation where previously those gaps would be open, there are now fake vehicle parts that occupy those spaces. This should should prevent enemies from slipping into your fully enclosed vehicle. And like I said, I don't understand what's going on behind the scenes or how it works, I just know that finally we can turn our vehicle without exposing the interior to our enemies. Now I will mention, depending on your tile set, this actually looks pretty hideous. In Altica, the fake parts appear just like normal parts, which leads to a pretty ugly and incomprehensible mess of sprites. I don't know the first thing about tile sets, I have no idea how or if you can fix this problem, and to me, it being ugly is totally worth it because it solves a long-standing problem with the game. The gap issue with vehicles has existed since I started playing this game, which, you know, I don't know how long it's been, but it's definitely been like five years that this problem has existed. And for me personally, like most older players, I just learned to never park on a diagonal and to drive only in cardinal directions when I was around enemies. Now, I have seen some people say that the fix makes the vehicles ugly and that it's not worth it because you can just learn to deal with the gap issue. Honestly, I think this is a really terrible opinion. Kevin and apparently many other people have worked on and tested this to put an end to a long-standing bug. This is a really good change, even if it doesn't currently look very pretty. I'm confident that given a little time, someone will attempt to address the appearance of the fix. I don't think it will look this way forever. Or maybe it will, I don't really care. And to imply that we should leave a bug in the game because you don't really like the way the solution looks is just a crazy opinion to me. Anyway, yeah, I might not fully understand the solution, but I am glad to see this getting fixed. This PR was started back in March, so it obviously took a lot of tweaking and reviewing before it ever got merged. Now, in addition to all this information, I do want to mention that there could be some issues moving forward. I did see at least one issue that was posted about there still being gaps in vehicles in certain circumstances. The issue that I saw referenced a very long vehicle that was five tiles wide. I don't have any more information on that, but with such a big change like this, I do expect there will be some issues despite the massive amount of testing that probably already went into this. Right, so I consider this to be a really good fix. I imagine most of you will be happy to see this as well, and I'm, I'm really glad to see this come to the game. And then finally today we've got a pretty massive PR from A. Chansey. Now I initially had a lot of difficulty kind of parsing this information. It's a very large PR. It changed uh, like 154 files, which is, you know, that's kind of a lot. Now I did eventually get to talk to the creator on Discord, so I'm going to give you like my opinion and then I'm going to read a little bit of what the creator posted. So my interpretation from the player side is that tailoring materials now come in two forms. There are small pieces, which are called patches, and then there are larger pieces that are called sheets. Now we already sort of had this for cotton previously, we had rags and then we had patchwork sheets, but this PR standardizes the naming convention for all materials. Rags have also been renamed to cotton patches so that they are consistent with the naming convention for all of these other materials. In the future, crafting gear will probably require both types of these materials. It makes sense, right? You would use large sheets for the bulk of a garment and then you would maybe use smaller pieces for smaller parts. And then also for actually small crafts, say the uh, cloth part of a sling, you wouldn't need a large sheet of fabric, you would just use patches. Now this PR also did a common sense audit of a huge number of recipes in the game, and this is basically just mathing things out to make sure that the garments require an appropriate amount of material. So that was my interpretation, but because it was such a large PR and it did a lot of different things, I was struggling to understand what exactly had changed. So I did manage to talk to the creator a bit on the dev discord, and this is some of the information information that they offered. And I quote, the main goals were to give a unified terminology between the fabrics based on size and provide a path to turn patches into their sheet equivalents. The exception that was listed here was for Kevlar and that was for realism reasons so that it could retain its ballistic resistance. Fabrics were also adjusted to realistic weights and volumes based on real life data and then recipes and items were adjusted to be in line with the new weights and thicknesses. Which is frankly a much more eloquent summary than I 
I could have provided you. Between that and my interpretation, hopefully that all makes sense. Special thanks to, uh, I'm just going to call you A Chancy because I have no idea how to pronounce your Discord name. Uh, but thank you for chatting with me, taking some time to actually explain some of the things I had questions about. People will often comment on the show. They'll say like, oh, you should talk more with the devs and the contributors when you have questions, but I, I never do that. Unless I know the person pretty well, I usually don't reach out to people. And I want to be clear, that's not the fault of the devs or whatever. I'm pretty sure if I pinged any dev on the Discord, they would at least take a moment and talk with me, especially if I had questions about something they were working on. It's just, you know, something, something social anxiety is the main reason I don't do that. But anyway, I think that's a wrap for the show today. Hopefully you learned something or found some information that will be helpful as you play the game. As always, thank you for watching. I, of course, will be back with another episode in a couple of weeks, and I'll see you next time.